Okay, so today I want to talk about Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality. So before I state Markov's inequality, I want to try to sniff out what might be a reasonable form to get. So the setup is the following. We have a random variable x, and we're given the expected value of x, its mean. And the goal is we want to estimate or bound the probability that x is larger than some threshold. So this is the goal for Markov. Not surprisingly, the more information I know about my random variable, the better bound I can get. You know, for instance, if I tell you what distribution x is, I might even be able to do the calculation exactly. So the question is, if I just give you a general random variable, what can we say? Now, there are some conditions in Markov's inequality. I've not stated the inequality. I've not stated what the conditions are. I want to try to get a sense of what they might be. So let's try to see what kind of estimates we can get. If you had to choose a value for the mean, what would you choose? Zero. Zero, OK. So let's assume mu equals 0. Let's take a equals 2. So I am going to consider every possible random variable in the universe that has mean 0, and I want to estimate the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2. That probability should change greatly depending on which random variable I use. And so the question is, can I get a useful bound that works for all random variables? And I have to use the word useful. I actually looked at my video from last year, and I had some real smart asses who gave me bad stuff last year. Can somebody give me a bad bound for the probability that x is at most a? Yeah, it's at most 1. Can you give me an even worse bound? Five. Great. Can you give me a lower bound for the probability that it's at least a? Zero. Can you give me an even worse lower bound? Negative a million. Right. Okay. So we can get bounds without any trouble. The question is we want non-trivial bounds. Okay. That's the goal. The goal is a non-trivial bound. So when we write estimate, we want non-trivially. So let's try to think about what the answers could be here. Can anybody give me a random variable x with a probability that x is greater than or equal to a is equal to 0? And we're, we're taking a equals 2. And I want it to have mean 0. You have all the probabilities directly on the mean. OK, so you're going to have all the probability on the mean. So the probability x equals 0 equals 1. Or maybe x is uniform on the interval minus 1, 1. Both of those would work and give the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2 as 0. What about 50%? Can anybody give me the probability that x equals 2 is 50%. Half the probability into half on negative. Sure. So probability x equals 2 is the probability x equals negative 2 equals 1 half. And we're actually doing greater than or equal to 2. So I could do um, x is uniform on maybe minus 4, minus 2, union. 2, 4. You know, if I do something like that, you know, a joining of two uniforms, that will have probability 1 half. Is it possible to have the probability of x greater than or equal to 2 to be larger than a half? How could I do that? How high do you think we can get this probability? Basically, 1. We can get the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2 to equal 1 minus epsilon for any epsilon. 
I'm not going to go through the details, I'm going to just give a quick sketch. Here's 0, here's 2, here is a very large negative number, negative big. All right. You can figure out exactly what you want to put in. Put in a small mass, maybe probability epsilon that you have negative big, and over here have the probability be 1 minus epsilon that you equal to 2. And we just choose negative big so that the mean is equal to 0. So you, know, you can figure out what that calculation is. As long as I keep moving this far enough to the left, I can get this probability as close to 1 as I want. Well, that tells us that there is no way we're going to get anything useful just by looking at a random variable x given the mean. So again, it's very easy for me to give you a lecture on Markov's inequality. I can state Markov's inequality. I can prove it. You know, not a big deal. What I want you to see is I want you to see why we might expect something like this, why we might go for conditions like this. You get to choose what conditions you want to put on. The whole point here is we're trying to get something non-trivial. The more information we put on, the more chance we have of getting something. If all we know is the mean, there is no chance of getting anything non-trivial because by arguments like this, I can make that probability anything I want in the range from 0 to 1. So we need additional information. So what's the additional restriction we have in Markov? So in Markov's inequality, we assume something else. What's that condition? It's non-negative. So assume x is greater than or equal to 0, and the expected value of x equals mu. So now we are putting in a huge restriction on our random variables. Notice that this completely kills what we were doing over here with this negative big. We can no longer keep moving things further and further down to the left because our random variable has to be non-negative. Okay? And hopefully now you can get a sense of why we're dealing with a restriction like this. Then Markov says the following. <coughs> The probability that x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. And again, whenever you see an inequality, it's always worthwhile to ask, is this reasonable? When is it useful? Are the units appropriate? So I always like to think of things in terms of units. That's going to be huge today. If x is in meters, a should be in meters. This is a ratio that's going to be unitless. Great. Probability should be unitless. So x, a, same units. Ratio is unitless. So this is a great indication that the expected value of x over a is worth studying. That this is a quantity that should control what's going on. It's unitless. When is this inequality useless? OK, a little bit more generally than a equals 0. That works, but so it's undefined if a is 0, so it's useless. But you can do a little bit better than a equals 0. Useless if, if a is less than or equal to the expected value of x. So if a is less than or equal to the expected value of x, this is giving you no information saying the probability is at most 1. You know, what is the probability that Professor Miller will talk about either his kids or the Red Sox in class today? Well, actually, the probability for that is almost always 1, I think. So that's not a hobble bound. But in general, if I tell you the probability of something is at most 1, I'm not giving you useful information. Okay? If I tell you the probability is at least 0, I'm not giving you useful information. Markov's inequality does not kick in and become useful until a is greater than or equal to x. And if you want, as an exercise, what you could do is you could try to come up with some distributions similar to what we had over here and see what these probabilities might be for a less than or equal to the mean. And you try to play some of these games. And you could imagine all the probability is at the mean, or maybe some of the probability is going down from the mean towards 0 and seeing what you get. As soon as a is larger than the mean, this becomes useful. All right, so the proof is the following. I'm going to assume we have a continuous random variable because I like drawing the integral sign more than drawing the sum sign. If you don't like integral signs, you can draw it with the sum sign. All right. So we want to calculate the probability 
that x is greater than or equal to a. So by definition, it's the integral little x goes from a to infinity of fx of x dx. I right, we're trying to get an upper bound for the probability. So we're going to replace this integral with something that's larger. This is going to be a proof by multiplying by 1. And a lot of these proofs come down to can you find a clever way to multiply by 1. This is less than or equal to the integral x goes from a to infinity of x over a fx of x dx. The fact that this is true is trivial because in the region of integration, x is at least a, so x over a is at least 1. So I'm integrating in a range where x over a is at least 1. This is trivial to justify. The difficulty is why would you ever do something like this? So why would we multiply by x over a? Why are we doing this? Yes? Not quite, almost, but it's looking like an expected value. <coughs> Over here, notice that we're trying to get an expected value of x. Well, if we're trying to get an expected value of x, I should have an integral of xp of x somewhere, xf of x somewhere, however I wanted to find my density. How can I get that? Well, let's just I, well I can't just multiply by x. And if I multiply by x over x, that's just 1 in a bad way. Ah, so I'm going to multiply here by x over a. This is less than equal, this is greater than equal to 1. This is OK. And now I can pull out the a, and this is equal to 1 over a, the integral x goes from a to infinity of x f of x dx. Now I can extend the integration down to 0. And if I extend the integration down to 0, is that OK? So this is equal, so this is less than or equal to 1 over a, the integral x goes from 0 to infinity of x, fx of x dx, and this is just the expected value of x divided by a. And that finishes the proof. OK. So now let's see if we can get the camera to move. Nope. OK. So that finishes the proof. Any questions on the proof? Where did we use the assumption that our random variable was non-negative? When, when we extend the integral. So how are we using it when we extend the integral? Like, so if it was negative, you could potentially be like, We could, right. If, the, if there was positive probability when x was negative, well, we have an x over here because we have a x f of x. That would then give us a negative number that would lower the quantity. It would no longer be a less than. So this extension is where we use the fact that our random variable is non-negative. OK. So this is Markov's inequality. And it tells you that if you know the mean, you can estimate the probability that you are a certain amount above the mean. And the answer is going to be related to the ratio of the expected value and how far you want to go. And they're in the same units. OK. Any questions on Markov? OK, the next one is Chebyshev. There are lots of different proofs of Chebyshev. I will do the proof that uses Markov's inequality first as a nice application. Anybody know why Chebyshev is my favorite mathematician of all time? He has a, why is his name great? I mean, it's 40 different transliterations. I am an atrocious speller. Okay, And so the fact that you can spell Chebyshev's name 40 different ways and have it accepted by the mathematics statistics community is wonderful. What I have been trying to do for years, and I can't convince people to do this, is Chebyshev has so many theorems, we should spell his name differently for different theorems. Yes. Like yes. You can write a paper like with Austin's theorem and just like change it Right. It's yeah. I'm I'm getting absolutely no traction on this. 
Shevy Shev's inequality. All right, so x is a random variable with finite mean mu and finite. Do you want standard deviation or finite variance? Variance. Sigma squared. Then the probability x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma is less than or equal to 1 over k squared. Or the probability that x minus mu is less than or equal to uh, k sigma um, is greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over k squared. I'm assuming x is continuous, so not worrying about endpoints. And we can fix that in a moment. But these two events are not entirely complementary. So we can worry about that in a moment. Right now, I'll assume I have a continuous random variable. So whenever you see an inequality like this, you always want to ask, when is it useful? And why are we measuring things the way we're measuring? So what values of k is this going to be useful? <coughs> when is this going to be something worth looking at? I'm sorry? So if k is non-zero, so if k equals 1 half, is this useful? When does this kick in and become useful? k is greater than 1. Need k greater than 1 to be useful. Right. As a parent, you shouldn't be asking, you know, when is my kid useful? My kid is useful when they can mow the lawn, shovel the driveway, change the TV. For inequalities, however, it's absolutely acceptable to say things like this. You can say this inequality is useless unless k is at least a number greater than 1. Yes? Why? Well, if I take k equals 1 half, I get the probability is less than or equal to 4. So telling you that the probability is at most 4 is not doing anything. So, you know, again, I am very picky with my inequalities. You know, I want my inequalities to be useful. And it is not useful unless k exceeds 1. Now let's think about why this might be a natural thing to look at. Um, I think I've done this example in class before. The height of the average American male. I'm sorry? I think it's a little lower than 5'10", but we'll take 5'10". I, I thought it was more like 5'8". We'll take 5'10". And what's the fluctuations? Not. 9 inches squared. So when you're giving the uncertainty in the heights, you would never report the uncertainty in heights in inches squared. Inches squared is an area. You know, maybe if we're talking about how fat the American meal is, maybe <laughs> that would be an appropriate unit. But when we're talking about height, we would be using a unit of length. So when we're really doing this problem, you gave me the variance sigma squared. And again, it makes absolutely no difference mathematically. But to some extent, I almost think it's better to say in finite standard deviation sigma. Because sigma and the mean have the same units. And so what am I doing here? I want to know I have my mean mu. And I want to talk about the probability I'm a certain distance away from the mean. When I want to talk about the distance away from the mean, I need to know what scale to measure things in. Am I measuring things in meters, in feet, in furlongs, in parsecs? I want to use the correct units. And so I want to measure things in terms of units. K is unitless. Sigma has the same units as these. So I'm saying this has the same units. I'm talking about how many multiples of the standard deviation away. K is unitless. 
and these have the same units. Okay? And so this is a very natural thing to look at because now I'm looking at the deviation as a number of copies of the same deviation. Uh, since I mentioned Star Wars earlier today, how many of you have seen the original Star Wars movie? Okay, what is the unit mistake they make in the Star Wars movie? They measure speed in parsecs? Yes. They, me they, they talk about how great of a ship the Millennium Falcon is, and Han Solo's insulted that they haven't heard of his ship. It's the ship that made the Kessel run in under so many parsecs. A parsec is a measure of distance. You know, I'm going to be very careful because this is being recorded and George Lucas is very well known and has people everywhere. Great movie. All right. Uh, they, they fix this in some of the latest Star Wars stuff by saying the Millennium Falcon is so cool it could actually travel through parts of space other ships couldn't in the contest and that's why I was able to do it in a shorter distance. But they got the distance wrong. You always want to be thinking of units. I think I might have mentioned the Mars probe that crashed. Did I mention this one? The $25 billion whoopsie. Uh, all of the systems were in metric except for one which was in the English system. So when it was calculating how much thrust it needed for the landing, one of the systems was reporting in the English system, but the other parts of the probe thought it was reporting in the metric, and it miscalculated how much thrust was needed. And so you, have a, uh, you basically have this $25 million blunder. Okay. Units are important. It is worth spending the time and really thinking about what's going on, what are the units, what is the correct scale to be using for these things? <coughs> All right, so we want to prove Chebyshev. So one way to prove it is to use Markov's inequality. So proof one, let's let y be x minus mu squared. What can you tell me about this random variable? What do you, yes? So it's expected value. The expected value of y is the variance of x is sigma squared. And what else do we know about this random variable? It's non-negative. Non the conditions of Markov's inequality are met. And so now we get the probability that y is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of y divided by a. <coughs> so just using Markov. And now all we have to do is unwind and figure out what do we want to choose a to be. OK? So we've got the probability x minus mu squared is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of y, which is sigma squared divided by a. All right, well, you know, looking at what we have here, uh, we have a probability of x minus mu squared. Well, if we have an x minus mu squared, this is the same as the probability of the absolute value of x minus mu is greater than or equal to the square root of a. <coughs> Right? So less than or equal to sigma squared over a. So all we have to do is figure out what should we take for square root of a. And so given that we're trying to prove Chebyshev's inequality, well, over here, if we look at Chebyshev, we want to show that this is greater than or equal to k sigma. So that tells us we need to take a to square root of a to be k sigma. I have no idea why he doesn't want to swivel today. Um, maybe he wants to be like this. All right. So we want to take, that uh, looks like it's drunk. All right. Uh, so we want to take square root of a to be k sigma, right? Right? All right. So if we want to take square root of a to be k sigma, Alright. <laughs> so, hopefully that wasn't seen by the. So we want square root of a to be k sigma, right? Yeah. 
And now if we just substitute this in, what do we get? So this becomes the k sigma over here, and then over here, uh, square root of a is k sigma, so this becomes k squared sigma squared, which is 1 over k squared. And there's the proof. So Chebyshev is a, basically the same as Markov's inequality. The difference is which random variables you can apply this to. If I have a random variable where I know the mean and the variance, Chebyshev is great. Not every variable has a mean and variance. Markov, we just require a mean and we require non-negativity. All right, let me give you a second proof. So the second proof will be the following. We want to calculate the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma. Okay? This is the integral of x minus mu greater than or equal to k sigma of fx of x dx. So all these proofs go the same way. We start off with the definition of the probability we're trying to calculate, and now we want to get an upper bound. This is less than or equal to the integral x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma of x minus mu over k sigma squared fx dx. Essentially, we're just repeating what we did in Markov's inequality. We're doing the same argument again and again. You could prove Chebyshev directly using the same ideas as Markov. Why is this useful? Well, x minus mu over k sigma squared is going to be at least 1 in this range. So now we do exactly as we did before. We pull out a k squared, sigma squared. We have an integral x minus mu greater than or equal to k sigma, x minus mu squared fx of x dx. And now we extend the integration over the entire range. When we had Markov's inequality, we had to worry, and we needed to assume that our random variable was non-negative. We don't have to worry now because this is always non-negative for the integrand. So this will then be less than or equal to 1 over k squared, sigma squared, uh, the integral of x minus mu squared fx of x dx. And what is this integral equal? The variance. Sigma squared. Sigma squared divided by sigma squared is 1. So this is 1 over k squared. So this is Chebyshev. OK? We'll see towards the end of the semester some really nice applications of Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, you know, if I had to list which inequalities I like the most, Chebyshev would be towards the top of the list. I actually like Chebyshev a little bit more than the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is a lot stronger than Chebyshev. Right? No, we've, we've stated the central limit theorem once or twice earlier in the semester. You know, it basically says if you have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables that are sufficiently nice, the sum converges to being normally distributed. And you can use that to do a wonderful job of estimating probabilities. Why do you think the central limit theorem is able to do a better job than Chebyshev? It's a little hard because we haven't really rigorously stated the central limit theorem. Why do you think the central limit theorem does a better job? <coughs> I'm sorry? No, because I mean, I, I could compare them when k equals 5. <coughs> so it's not going to be just. But, but, wh but why does the central limit theorem give you a better result? It requires more assumptions. The power of Chebyshev is that all I'm assuming is finite mean, finite variance. Not surprisingly, the more you assume, the better you can do. So as a brief aside, before we do an application of Chebyshev, I thought I would try to just motivate why knowing more allows you to do more. And so the following is one of my favorite examples. You know, I've done this in Calc 3. Uh, based on time, I might not go through all the details, but just give you a you know, rough sketch right now. So, one of the biggest problems in mathematics is solving equations, is finding answers. 
And so there's two great methods. The first is the method of divide and conquer. And you assume f is continuous. Let's say you know the function is positive at 0 and negative at 1. If the function is positive 0 and negative at 1, what can you deduce? It's 0 at some point. It's 0 at some point. Let's go at the halfway point 1 half. Let's assume it's positive here. What do you know? It might still be 0 here. It might be 0 multiple times in here. But you know there's at least one 0. Now we go halfway between 3 fourths. Let's say it's negative there. So, it's, so every time you iterate, divide, and conquer, you have your interval of uncertainty. So if you do it 10 times, your error drops by 1 over 2 to the 10, which is approximately 1 over 1,000. So you get about three decimal digits every 10 times you do this. So if you want to get something to six digits accuracy, eh, you've got to do this roughly 20 times. All right, what I want to do now is I want to show you another method called Newton's method. For the most part, people like Newton do not have their names attached to bad results. All right, as soon as you see something with the name Newton, Gauss, Probably it's a good algorithm. All right, this is what Newton does. Let's say f is continuous and differentiable. And so let's say you want to approximate where this function is 0. What you do is the following. You take a point on the curve, you calculate the tangent line, and you replace the function with its tangent line, and you look to see where they intersect. Is the function the same as its tangent line? No. You're basically saying the first order Taylor series at this point exists everywhere and is the value of the function everywhere. No. But if you do that, if you take this tangent line, that will give you an approximation. And this will give you a new point. And then you do one of the most important methods in mathematics. It's the lather, rinse, repeat. Right? You just keep playing the game again. Now you use this as your new starting point, as your new x-coordinate, and you find the value of the function here. You draw the tangent line. It's hard for me to draw this because Newton's method is this accurate. So roughly what goes on is the following. Let's say we have f of x is x squared minus 3. So what am I trying to find? What number am I trying to find? Square root of 3. I'd, uh, just because my memory is not so good, the square root of 3 is approximately 1.732050580756887. That should be enough. All right. f prime of x is equal to 2x. And so what we can do is if we have some point xn, we have xn f of xn, we have a slope is f prime of xn. And so we get the tangent line y minus f of xn equals the <coughs> slope f prime of xn times x minus xn. At the intercept point, that'll be xn plus 1, what can you tell me about the value of y? What will that be? 0. zero. So you get 0 minus f of xn is f prime of xn times xn plus 1 minus xn. So for us, um, f of xn is going to be, let's see, so we get a f of xn divided by f prime of xn over here, then we move an xn over here, minus and this should be xn plus 1. And so you get a really nice formula for xn plus 1. Uh, if memory serves after you do all the algebra, I believe you get xn plus 3 over xn with a factor of 1 half, I think, when all the algebra simplifies. And you get an incredibly accurate formula to just keep iterating and getting values. All right, so what do you think is a really bad but acceptable first guess for the square root of 3. 
Give me a reasonable guess for square root of 3. 2. 2.00. OK. If you iterate this method once, you get 7 fourths, which is 1.75. If you iterate it twice, you get 97.56. You'll always get rational numbers, which is 1.732148. If you iterated three times, all right, it's 18,817 over 10,864, 1.732058100014. I'll do one more. X4 is 7081589770 over. Forgive me for not memorizing this, 408-855-776, which is 1.732050807568887. I can keep going, 7193, and over here is 8877 you can see the remarkable number of digits of agreement with just four iterations. This is how your calculators work. This is how calculators find values to these things. They don't have everything memorized. They have very fast algorithms. It is a huge game of approximation. The value of Newton's method over divide and conquer is divide and conquer 10 iterations gains you three digits. Newton's method, every iteration doubles, essentially, the number of decimal digits of accuracy. So you do this one more time, you're going to have over 20 digits accurate as a nice rational approximation. Why does Newton's method do such a better job than divide and conquer? It's calculus. Calculus. It uses the fact that the function is differentiable. It uses the fact that we have a tangent line. Not surprisingly, if you use advanced techniques and powerful tools, you can get better results. Why do you think people still care about divide and conquer? We can still take calculus classes. It doesn't have to be differentiable. There are a lot of functions that are extremely important that are not differentiable. We're going to see later the method of least squares where we square errors. You could use absolute values to measure your errors, in which case you have things that are not differentiable, and then you need to use divide and conquer. Why is Newton's method always result in rational numbers? Uh, well, it, it results in rational numbers for the problem we're looking at because we have you know, x squared minus 3. The derivative is going to be 2x. You start with rational, you'll end up with rational because of how things are. So for this particular problem, it will always be rational. So I hope this gives you some sense, not just of the power of Newton's method, but the power of the central limit theorem over Chebyshev. Okay? The central limit theorem is going to be a lot stronger than Chebyshev because we're assuming a lot more about our distribution. Not surprisingly, the more we assume, the more we can prove. The difficulty is that those assumptions are not always met. And that's why Chebyshev still has a place. Because there will be times when we will not know all those things. We could have a modified Cauchy distribution where maybe it does have a mean and a variance, but it doesn't have a finite third moment. In a situation like that, the central limit theorem will actually be unusable. There's actually versions of related results where you don't even need to have a finite variance. In fact, you don't even need to have a finite mean. It's called the median theorem that we might get to later in the semester. So again, depending on how bad your distribution is, you want to have different tools at your disposal. OK. The other thing is, sometimes you only need really weak bounds. It might be the case that I'm studying some problem where k is a parameter tending to infinity. And I just need a really weak bound. And so for a lot of these problems, the central limit theorem is overkill. And if I can prove a result with less work, let me go for it. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. Let's look at a new distribution, the Laplace distribution. Any of you ever seen the Laplace distribution? All right. So I'll, I'll do the standard Laplace. f of x is equal to 1 half um, e to the negative absolute value of x. And so if I just had 
e to the negative x from 0 to infinity, that would be the standard exponential. It would integrate to 1. Because I'm doubling it and making it symmetric, I have to put in the factor of 1 half for the normalization. So my distribution looks like this. I have exponential decay on both sides. What's the expected value of x? Zero. All right, so the variance of x, this is going to be really nice, is just going to be the second moment, which is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x squared times 1 half e to the minus x dx. Well, this is the same as I can go from 0 to infinity and double it, because it's symmetric. And so I have the integral from 0 to infinity of x squared e to the minus x dx. And how would we evaluate this? I can think of two ways to evaluate this. Integration by parts. One is integration by parts. The other is to recognize we've seen this integral before. Where have we seen this integral? Let me, let me write the integral in a more comfortable manner. Integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x, x to the 3 minus 1 dx. It's a gamma function. It's just gamma of 3, which is 3 minus 1 factorial equals 2. So this is a way for me to quickly review the gamma function and lead into Sterling's formula, which we'll be doing on Friday. All right? So we could calculate that without any trouble. We now have that the variance is 2. So I want to, calc I want to bound the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to maybe uh, 7 times 2. So I want to talk about the probability that I'm at least 7 standard deviations from the mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we have the variances too, so the standard deviation is square root of 2. I need a square root here. So what would be a bound for the probability that I'm 7 standard deviations away from the mean? 1 over 49. So this would be less than or equal to 1 over 7 squared, which is 1 over 49. <coughs> Hopefully now you can see why I chose 7. You know, 1 over 49 is approximately 1 50th. It's about 0.02. If somebody has a calculator and wants to give me the exact answer, I'll wait for that in a moment. All right. So while somebody's getting that, 0 0.02048. Excellent. Do you think Shebyshev did a good job or not? How can we tell if it did a good job? What could we do? Yeah, let's see what it actually is, right? The probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to 7 square roots of 2, it's just going to be by symmetry. I integrate 2, and then I'll go 7 square roots of 2 to infinity, e to the minus x dx. Right? Because my probability distribution is symmetric, so I can just go, oh, and I have a factor of 1 half. So that's the actual probability. And let's just calculate it. So the 2's cancel, and I have, now I integrate e to the minus x, I get <coughs> e to the minus x, the minus sign flips the bounds of integration, 7 square roots of 2 and infinity, and I get e to the negative 7 square roots of 2. All right, can someone tell me what e to the negative 7 square roots of 2 is? It's, it's 0.02048. Oh, okay. Thank you. And so what is e to the negative 7 root 2? OK, 0 point 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. OK, 5. That's enough. Not very good. OK, so 
Just because Shebishev gives us a bound does not mean it gives us a good bound. Why do you think Shebishev did such a poor job? I want to use stronger language, but you know, I, I don't want to have this rated R or anything. Why is it doing such a bad job? Very little information. Shebishev is trying to be all things to all people at all times. It has basically the minimum requirement. All Shebishev cares about, if it wants to be under discussion, is that you have a finite mean and a finite variance. As long as you satisfy those constraints, Shebishev will give you a statement about your probability. That is a lot of ground to cover. That's a lot of distributions to cover. It is saying, it is being required to say things about too many distributions all at once. And that's why you end up getting very bad bounds. Because it has to be so universal. How do you think we could do better? Probably adding in more moments, you know, knowing a little bit more about the shape of the distribution. And to some extent, the hope is that if you add in enough moments, you actually know what the distribution is. Well, if you know what the distribution is, you can do the calculation. There's probably a reason we're not doing the calculation. Often the calculation is very hard. And so we want some ways to estimate the probabilities. Sometimes we only need a crude estimate. This estimate here, you know, a 2% chance. How do you feel about a 2% chance? You know, it depends what it's a 2% chance of. If it's a 2% chance of rain today, okay, you can live with that. A 2% chance of snow, you can live with that. You know, 2% chance that uh, the midterm is actually due tomorrow. You know, different things have, you know, different comfort zones, okay? 0. 0.00005, you know, at this point, you're not really caring too much about what the event is. You know, this is not really happening, All right? So when we get to the central limit theorem, the central limit theorem is going to hold to a large class of distributions. We're going to prove it for distributions that have all moments finite. And in fact, not only are their moments finite, but their moments have a certain growth rate. They don't grow too rapidly. That's a restriction. And it's because of that restriction that we end up getting a wonderfully universal result. All right, so this is a good place to end.